Uh, welcome back to our session. Uh, today, we are going to have a conversation with five artist, activists uh, on the topic of art and social change. Uh, the conversation is happening under the Kikao Junction, which is a project uh, run by Foreign Civ. This is an international organization that has membership in 160 countries. Uh, the organization strives for fair and sustainable global development based on equal value of all people, their right to reasonable life circumstances and sustainable use of the world's natural resources. So the Kikao Junction uh, is a session for social change and reflections from five activists will focus on the role of artists in social change movements, uh, communication strategies, and how we can highlight the cultural strategy to help shift the way think, people think about their world. So welcome, and I hope you are going to enjoy our conversation today. Thank you. So we are going to introduce our panelists today for the conversation. And our panelists are drawn from uh, across the continent. Yes, so we're going to introduce our panelists. And so to make it easier, uh, we'll, let's start from home. So we are going to start with Mofasa, who is going to tell us uh, the art that he's involved in, and then basically how his journey has been for one minute introduction before we get into the core of the conversation. One minute, one minute, man. <laughs> I have a lot to say about myself. You have all the time in the world. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, thank yes. You, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ricky. Uh, my name is Mufasa. I am a performance poet. I am an author. I, I basically use art to speak about day-to-day -day, uh, ha happenings around me uh, in Africa, within Kenya, uh, around the world. And I, I, I love poetry a lot. Basically, poetry is the tool that I use, uh, sometimes on page, sometimes on stage. But this, this, is, this is the perfect tool for me. Uh, I love it especially because of the fact that it somehow connects or comes from, a, from an honest and soulful place that is more relatable uh, to people and even uh, more comfortable for me myself. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Ricky. That's one minute. OK, so let's move to our next panelist. Yes, yes, you can speak. Oh, um, so my name is Yibo Kujo Yibo. I'm a Ghanaian, and uh, my art is mainly in the, the visual and then also the verbal. I do spoken word poetry, I paint, I sculpt, and uh, currently I'm very much involved in organizing youth development projects around the uh, Ghana, and then also sometimes outside my own country. Thank you. Thank you. Our next panelist. Masi, Masi, yes, yes, we can hear you. Good yes, Matthew, afternoon. You can speak. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? My, my name is Mercy Liwayo. I'm also known on the stage as Sister X. I'm a poet, um, an MC, a rapper, and uh, an author. Um, my journey with art has basically begun as a medium of self-expression, a platform for venting, um, a platform for, from, for com confrontation, but um, as time moved and as I practiced more with my art, 
it soon became a, a tool that I could use to add my voice to the many voices in the world that uh, deal with issues that impact us as human beings, as women, as Africans, as um, marginalized marginalized people in society. So basically, my art has become a tool of, of um, advocacy. So that's basically me. Thank you, thank you. Yes, yes, our next panelist. Yes, can you hear us? Okay, so Mufasa, I, I think we're going, we going to start off with you uh, in terms of, I've, I've followed your art for some time, so I have a little bit of the background of how you started and how you're going, but just for our audiences and our panelists as well, uh, can you just tell us uh, how did you uh, start doing what you are doing now and what was the main inspiration behind what you are doing? Yes, Mufasa? Yeah, sorry. Uh, so I I think I started, I started performance poetry when I came to Nairobi. Definitely at the time, this was, it was a new art form. It still may very much is a new uh, art form, per se. Uh, but back then, it was really new. And I remember I, I encountered it first in Nairobi, of course. And I was in Nairobi, the capital city of Kenya. And I was here and I was, uh, someone took me to an open mic and I could not believe it. Like, I could not believe it, the fact that people could sit around just to listen to one person speak. Uh, I was used to music and, and, and stuff like that, but now when it comes to just somebody just speaking, and this was not even storytelling, somebody was just literally speaking, and guys were listening, and there's a way, there's a way I was carried, basically, watching the performance, and I remember I really connected to it, and I really wanted it. Uh, and it comes... To me also because i was more of i was more of someone who used to keep a lot of things to myself and now writing became something different and basically performing became something different as a way for me to release to express myself like i felt like this, this I, I felt basically like, like i was releasing something every time i wrote you know and now learning about performance poetry what it did now was i had a chance now to not just write but to perform as well what i had written before and i used to have things that i did and yes but they were not exactly performance poetry so being around here i went to more open mic stages i went to slam po slam i went slam to slam and the journey started off uh basically i was invited to perform i remember at uh, at the supreme court somebody saw me performing somewhere and they invited me to, the, to perform at the supreme court and i remember asking myself what am i going to perform like what am i going to tell what am I going to say before the Chief Justice? And then, and, and, yeah, what am I going to say? And this put me in a place where now I, I uh, basically, I started reading a lot. Uh, I started uh, learning more about people, about communities, about our country. Uh, and I think it's been a journey from then on until here. Uh, yeah, basically, I, I think that's, that's the beginning of, for me. And what has been happening all along now has been me trying to redefine my art form. Like basically when I started, it was just me and the mic. Uh, later on, I started introducing an acoustic feel into it. Basically just reimagining other ways of performing, of delivering my performance. And then uh, recently now I perform with a band as well, just basically to make sure that I'm available, or rather I'm accessible for all platforms are available. Like if someone needs a simple performance i can be there if it's a big gathering of people i can also uh, basically package my art in a way that it is it fits that stage so that has been my journey basically yeah so uh mufasa maybe going back to 
maybe the core of your work which has been uh, slam poetry. At what extent do you think that slam poetry has really ex enhanced maybe the ability of, of, of poets to link whatever creative uh, products they are producing to social change? I think the fact that we also, uh, what slam does, it, it has, it has uh, facilitators, you know? You have judges, you have facilitators, they have workshops. And what happens during these workshops is they sharpen you, they sharpen you. And as well, being amongst other artists, you know, challenges you. Like when you hear somebody talking about something that is in their community and stuff and something like that, it challenges you. You look at your writing and you're like, hey, I should, I, I, what am I writing? What am I saying? You know? Uh, so basically in that space of slam poetry, you are challenged to write about something that is around your community, about your community, or something that basically uh, that connects to people, that engages people, that engages the community, that engages your audience, that is relatable, that challenges your audience. Uh, and all this speaks to your conscience. So basically what it does is we are pushing slam poetry and poetry at large basically puts you in a space where you are pushing for consciousness, you know, consciousness in the communities, consciousness uh, in terms of even just uh, masses where you are, even at work, even at work, because I think all the platforms that you perform at, what you do with poetry is you 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 push them to that level of consciousness because hey man you look out here man i'm actually lucky that we have poetry it being an alternative uh alternative art art form because out here you know you, you get to a point where music and everything else whatever is whatever content is being shared is very for lack of i don't know what to put, i don't know how to put it safely but it's that pop sound you know like people say anything for numbers people say anything for uh to get an audience but at least what poetry does is it gives you that it's that alternative platform to offer something that is educational, but at the same time entertain, you know? Yeah. Wow. I, I, I think uh, maybe Marcy, Marcy has a very big link with poetry as well as she works on, a, on, on different platforms. Uh, uh, so Marcy, how is, how is Zimbabwe? How is the temperature there? Um, I, I would assume it's um, sunny in Zim. I'm currently not in Zimbabwe. I am based in Polokwane, South Africa, where I'm working. Um, but um, we share pretty much the same uh, with the climate. So here in Polokwane, it's sunny, a beautiful sunny day. Yeah. Um, how is it in Kenya? Uh, uh, so can you just take us through... Maybe your journey, how did you start uh, working in the forms that you're working with now? And did you always think that art could be a tool that could be used for social change? Um, when I began, I never really thought that far because I, I began at a, at a young age. I think um, around 12, 13, I started writing rap verses, obviously inspired by the likes of Tupac, um, the Queen Latifas were there back in the day. So when you heard them talk about their own struggles, that for me became the first outlet for me to like um, take out what I was feeling personally. Because you know, growing up, you go through a lot of things. So writing was my tool of of just expressing that. My my that was like my drug. Um, but then eventually, when I went to school, discovered oh, the other MCs at school. We started like hanging out in little corners there where we had little ciphers. Then we had ciphers in the park. And then when I went to university, um, I was taken away from a hip hop community that I, I, I had back home in Zim. And I tried to find a similar hip hop community on campus, but I couldn't find anything. This was now in South Africa, University of Limpopo. The closest thing that I found to a hip hop community was a poetry society. So when I got to university, that's when I got introduced to poetry uh, proper. That's when I started to now try, try to convert my raps into poetry form, poetic forms, um, even though I feel like there is no much of a div div dividing line. So um, my first stage performing poetry was on campus, on campus heritage festival events, campus talent shows. That's where I began performing poetry. But my biggest poetry stage uh, came at home in Bulawayo, the Intuasa Festival. 
So yeah, that was my first poetry stage on a large platform. So after I left university, there was a gap created by the fact that all along I've always had a community of artists, but now I'm, I'm out of the university system. I needed to find something to to sustain that that art artist in me. That's when um, I joined other groups in Polokwane that did poetry. But then soon, you know, groups start and then they die off. When they died off, that left a gap that needed to be filled. That's when I uh, and a couple of friends came together and we, we formed the Slam Emporium Polokwane. So what we basically do is we, we create platforms for um, performance for young up and coming artists. Um, artists who feel like they need the platform to perform. And we've managed to also have exchange programs between artists from Polokwane and from Zimbabwe. So that's um, what we've been doing from the, for the past um, six years now, since 2015. So uh, yeah, that has been my journey with poetry and poetry has also managed to take me to places I never thought I'd, I'd be. Uh, I've been to Uganda, I've been to, to Sweden um, through poetry. And also I've managed to take it away from just the stage to put it into musical format, seeing that my background came from hip hop um, I've managed to have some recorded projects, uh, an album called um, The X Agenda. And I've also managed to like um, s- uh, take away my views from just the poetic form and put them in, in book format, in, in short stories and, and, and novels, because I'm, I'm a creative writer. It just doesn't end with, with poetry. So that's what my journey has been like. So I'm continuously trying to find other ways of packaging my art and other ways of reaching people differently, seeing that times have changed, mediums need to change too. So that's pretty much my journey with poetry and art. Or maybe if we just get a little bit from Kojo as well. Uh, a verbalist, uh, I don't know whether <laughs> there are a good number of people out there who, if you say that you are a verbalist, they would sort of come up with a description of what kind of art you do. So maybe can you just take us through what, what does a, a verbalist entail in, in terms of uh, the art, the kind of art you produce, uh, maybe, and also give us just a short link. How does it uh, link with the idea of social change? Do you also have some kind of a commitment in your art to pursuing some kind of changes in the society? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Richard. Uh, So my journey, if I should uh, start before I come to the verbalist, started, I think, also way back in junior high school. Uh, I, for some reason, my teachers thought I have a good handwriting. So I was usually asked to write notes on the blackboard and then draw all the figures and images that are in the textbook for the rest of the students to also write as homework or something. So from that place, it gives me more chance for me to be doing more even difficult things. So my inclination into doing the art came from this direction. This is what I very much remember. So from then I continued with what I like as in drawing and writing and it led me through these uh, days. But to remember very well, I fell very much in love with the idea of art itself also at the before my 20s and so i started <clears throat> teaching myself how to draw and paint and then i got into apprenticeship and then uh, went on graduated and so it just kept going on and i realized that there are communities of artists who were around and so i started going to art exhibitions and uh, get myself more ideas or knowledge into this area of the art but then the spoken word also came in later my old school senior, well, let's say our school prefect, met me one time somewhere and just invited me to a fellowship. I didn't know what that was. He ended up being a, a religious or charismatic movement. And then whilst I'm in there, they get young people who come up to preach and then they speak all these big languages. And I was like, why not? I should also be able to give me the chance to do something. But for almost years, I never got the chance to do anything. So something just dropped in me that, man, you can always go out there and then do your thing. You don't need a small classroom or a small room to preach. Go into the world and then do it. So I just entered on the street and I started also preaching, like what they consider 
the dawn broadcast. You wake up in the morning. I was a little shy at the time, so I couldn't stand in front of people. So I started doing dawn broadcast. And then you hear people around 5 a.m. to 6 a.m. People come out and say, hey, that was good. So I didn't know at the time what that was leading me into. And then also from then, I realized that people began to comment on my doing what I was doing. Then I started getting these ideas in my head. I started writing them down. So at an exhibition of a friend of mine, I went and then I saw the works and I just started speaking some thought of mine and at Alliance Francaise and they were like, oh cool, that's poetry. That was my first time of hearing what poetry was and this was also somewhere the, the late or mid nineties. I didn't know at my time, I didn't know a lot of poets at the time. So it was difficult for me to even know what I was doing was poetry. So this went on also, I started coming to this shows art and meeting people who do all these art forms. Then I was like, okay, what I must do is also to find what I can do and call it something that looks like me. So I realized that my friend and I called Neil and Tim were like, okay, poetry sounds like, okay, the word itself is English. How can we call what we do? So we, created a word that we consider to be what we will call poetry because we love music, we love the art, we love all these forms of expression. So we came up with the word Ehalakasa, which is three languages in our country, Gantri and Ewo Eha means song, La means sing, and Kasa means talk. So we put these three words or languages together and we have the word Ehalakasa and then you can respond, it lives in us because we believe strongly that everything that is coming out of us is originally first within us before we can share them to the rest of the world. So that's how come I got into also the art form deeply. But my, <clears throat> my thing with the verbalist is that I had a lot of questions. I always used to have questions about the kind of art I do and how <clears throat> it's impacting society. So the question about the verbalist is that it has no heavy philosophy behind it. What it only says is that it is a list of verbs that I do, like doing things. So it's just those two words, verbal and then a list. So a verbal is someone who does the list of things. So if I perform these things, all these things I do in my performance, they are a list of verbs that I perform. So that's where the verbalist idea comes from. My <clears throat> first uh, performance, I think if I yes, should remember, uh, if, if I can just sort of uh, interject in in terms of the idea of verbalist, uh, I think there's, there's something that is coming out and uh, in terms of sound uh, being a very primary instrument uh, for creativity for artists. And when we move from uh, Mofasa and we move from Masi, and then we move from Kojo, we are seeing that in most cases, sound is, is that primary is that primary instrument that that you are using to drive basically the first stages of of whether it, you are moving into poetry whether it's in music whether it's in writing so i don't know i will just uh before you move on with the 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 the, the conversation on verbalist aspect i would probably ask or ask mufasa uh to what extent did you think sound uh, from a very germane level when before you just started doing your spoken word poetry to what level did you think that sound could be an instrument that could be employed to achieve bigger things beyond just expression I think the first the first idea would be on on the fact that you can gather people using your sound like when you think about storytelling when you think about people who just play the flutes when you think about people who forget about even about professional storytelling i mean even you look at your communities and everywhere even just your neighborhood you have guys who when they tell stories man who are good at storytelling people will gather around these people. So I think for me, it has always been the aspect of gathering people. Like you can use sound to gather people. The effectiveness of it was a bit different because for me, the first thing in my mind earlier on, uh, earlier on in, in my career, I used just to 
love the element of gathering people, you know. But it's been now through a continuous process of learning, like basically, what do I want to say? How do I improve my sound? How do I uh, make this better? Uh, basically, but now I think for me, in the beginning, the element of gathering people, using sound to gather people, for me, that was the effective tool that I took in the beginning. Yes, and Kojo, back to your verbalist. Uh, when when you are just starting off, and uh, the idea of sound, uh, the idea of talking, the idea of making creativity using sound. To what extent did you think this could be a primary tool in reaching out people, like Mufasa said, gathering people and talking to people, and especially in terms of learning? Yes. Yeah. For me, I think the the sound idea became real to me when I get into people when I approach people because I am the person, my presence is me first. And so if I don't move out, I don't see people. When I see people, it's vibrate or it resonates sound, all these sounds, the color of what they are wearing, their expression, even if they don't say anything, I hear things. And you see someone look some way in your mind, you hear a sound or a word or something. And this is where the origin of sound came for me. So I got also into the idea of using language or using words that are not understandable to other people, but then it's originally from the within. So like use, like gibberish. And this sound begins to ring in my head a lot. And so the sound became more practical and more usable for me when I go out and I see just anything around me. And Marcy, uh, I, I saw that you, you are a lawyer. Uh, and in law, I think the ability to verbalize things, uh, to make an argument is, is a principle tool that every lawyer must develop. I don't know to, to what extent has your sort of your writing, your poetry, uh, to what extent has it influenced uh, your lawyership? Or to what extent has the tools that you've gathered in law helped you to use art to, to drive social change? I think you've, you've muted your microphone. Oh, I got it right now. I no, I think it, yes, yes, yes. It, it has played uh, quite a pivotal role because firstly, as a lawyer, I know, um, I think it begins from a, a premises of knowing your rights. Uh, I'm a big advocate for, for human rights. That's um, as much as I practice mostly in labor law, my interests lie in uh, basic human rights. So I know that uh, this is what the law says my rights are. So mostly when I approach my, my art, I approach my music, I speak from that angle of knowing that these are the basic rights that each child, each woman, each human should have. So um, when I now go out and um, I, I do my poetry, I do my hip hop, I do my writing, it's from a premises of advocating for certain rights that I see that are lacking in my community, that are being violated in communities we see um, outside our own communities. and. Um, it, it, it pushes, when I come to right now, I'm pushing an agenda, which is mostly influenced by the knowledge of what things should be and not just acceptance of what things are. So yeah, a law continues to influence um, the way that I view and approach my art. You meant in African literature or maybe in African music as well. There's always the expectation that the artist uh, should have a commitment for social change. I, I don't know whether when you are starting your art or producing art, I don't know whether you started it expressly to speak, to commit to achieving social change, or it's something that came after uh, you'd already started working on your art, and then there were questions uh, in your basic audience of what is the function of your art is this is this something that came when you're starting or the idea that art could be used uh art has to be committed to social change is this something that came after or this is something that you started with immediately you began writing Marcy? 
Oh, um, it's definitely something that, that came after. Like, like I mentioned earlier, before uh, my art was a self-serving thing. It was all about me and just getting out whatever is happening inside. But um, when you realize that as much as um, it's coming from a personal point, uh, whatever I'm going through is not um, a phenomenon that's unique to only me. It's unique to, to many other people. So when I now went back and started doing my art, it seems to be just about venting. It seems to be about reaching people who could be in similar positions. It now became something that um, I used to, to challenge the status quo, something that um, had to serve a purpose because now I, I write a rap and um, I'm stuck with it. I say what I have to say, then what? You know, I want, to, I, I want my art to make some kind of a difference in somebody's life. I want my art to reach people in spaces of, of, of governance and spaces where they can make um, positive, tangible change. So it's a constant fight to have my art not just end at poetry shows or hip hop shows, but for it to reach uh, the legislature so that when he makes his, the legislation, they know that the legislation affects people in this way. This is what the people say. I want it to reach the masses in a way that it forces them to vote wisely, for example, to, to uh, question things, to interrogate their own existence. So um, as much as it be began from a personal point of view, it had to some, at some point serve a bigger purpose. And that's what I'm trying to achieve with my art now, like having it serve a purpose larger than um, self-serving um, art, which comes from a space of personal spaces. Wonderful. I think our audiences would also like to uh, know the specific pieces of art uh, that maybe you've developed over the past few years. And uh, maybe I'd go to Mofasa and Mofasa, I don't know whether you can share with us uh, the specific pieces of work, maybe in terms of uh, an album, in terms of a poetry collection uh, that you've done over the past few years. Uh, maybe you can have maybe three, around three pieces of work uh, that you've done over the past uh, a few years uh, that pursue a very specific uh, social change agenda? Uh, I think following up with uh, basically uh, um, whatever Marcy said in terms of the fact that our, our life experiences are not exactly unique. They might, they might not be the same, but they are quite relatable to other people. Uh, when I started writing, I remember the first, I remember this poem that I was writing. It was, it was called uh, Before My Daughter Is Born. And I wrote this piece because I grew up in that country. Basically, I was raised in that country. I grew up in a place where I probably the, the, I could see that my sister was basically, it was different for her compared to me. You know, as, as a man, the way a man is raised and the way a, a lady is raised uh, in that country is a bit different. Like I could see she was expected to be home by, I don't know, by 2 p.m. I could come home uh, past 7 p.m. Uh, she was expected to do all the duties. She was expected to like wake up, uh, the first person to wake up in the morning, uh, things like that. Uh, and I remember seeing as well stuff that was happening around me, including my cousins or something like that. Like anytime, let's say it's, if a lady got pregnant, then her school, uh, her education would be affected. Uh, there would be stigma around it. Uh, basically, people would talk about her, relatives would talk about her. School is a problem. Basically, they, it's like a shame is on how something like that, uh, especially when they get pregnant while they're, they're in school. But the man, you know, like the, the, the basically the father or the dude who who made the lady pregnant is out of question. They are they're safe from ridicule, from stigma, from anything like, you know, and they get to continue the education and everything else. So when I wrote the piece initially, it wasn't even from a point of an activist. No, I didn't even know what an activist was. It was basically just me sharing something that I had seen, you know, uh, happen around me. And I remember after sharing it, I started getting a lot of, uh, I could get like invitations to perform a function from the UN women and something like that. And later on now, in fact, I remember a point now, people would describe me as someone who fights for women's rights and stuff like that. Uh, but that wasn't even the point. And even until now, just the, the word activist for me, I struggle with it sometimes because it's almost like the moment you care about the society, the moment about you care about equality, the moment you care about uh, others living a life of dignity, 
you're an activist. And I'm like, no, you're just, you're just a human being. You just, just, I think you're just being a human being. Yeah. Uh, and I think the second project, that, so that, that basically catapulted me into that, uh, into that stage of writing. Uh, or probably I was there, but basically being defined as an, a, a person who writes for, uh, for change, for social change. And I remember the second, the second project would be the launch that we did. We did a, an album launch with uh, Tia Dubs, who's a Kenyan performance poet. He uses Sheng, which is a basically Kiswahili mixed with English. It's a slang language in, a, in Kenya, basically. And when we launched the, the album, it was called Unchained Voices. We did it together. And that was the beginning of so many things. That was the first basically public uh, spoken word. How do we call it? Just having solo events as performance poets, like having solo events. I think before that pe people had only launched albums, but after that we started doing social now solo performance events. So I think that's another project that now started many things for me. I would now have concept events where I gather people uh, and I have a concept event on it, speaking about uh, societal issues. Uh, went from now from women rights. Uh, to human dignity, to social rights, to police brutality. And I think after that now, the other thing would be, the other part of it all would be, apart from the album, I would, I would probably, I would, I would bring in the fact that when I got to the place where I started involving or using a band, it also changed things for me because I could access bigger platforms than I did before. And now this put me in a place where I would be in the same spaces with uh, artists in Kenya who speak about social change, like Eric Wanaina, like Giuliani, and we would be on the same stage. Uh, yeah, I, I would probably use those three significant points or periods in terms of... Um, uh, maybe tell us, tell us a little bit about, about the anthology, the book. Oh yes, yes. Because How I, can I, I forget? I think, I think the book. <laughs> I think the book. The book sort of encapsulated uh, the the very idea of social change. Uh, maybe you can That's very talk true. to us a little bit about the book. So the book is called Raising a Son, uh, and the concept of it all was the fact that we cannot always wait for light at the end of the tunnel. Sometimes we have to create our own light while we are still in the tunnel. Uh, I felt like the idea of us sitting and just saying, ah, we will wait for change to come in the future, does not make sense. Like, we have to act right now. If we believe that uh, it's the mindset that's the problem, then we need to change people's mindset right now. We can't wait, like, uh, the leaders will come from God or something like that. Now, nah, if we need if we need a, if we need a fair and equal country we need to find leaders who care about other people who care about human dignity who care about justice for all and the other thing as well was i also included the part of I, I, one, one, one of the subjects was around he for she basically fighting for women rights uh there i have pieces like before my daughter is born uh i have pieces like the girl i don't know and the girl i don't know was about basically about uh there's female circumcision uh and there's also the, the idea of basically girls being taken off school at, at young ages like at 14 at 12 at 13 to be married uh so it, it has been a, it, was, it was around that and the other aspect would have been basically as young men like they, instead of being used uh by politicians and everything we have to be part of positive change in the country so yeah so raising a son was basically about you know bringing the light into the world like bringing the light into our country like changing things not just sitting there and waiting for things to change like changing them participating in the change ourselves thank you wow thank you uh i'll push the same question to kojo uh in um in terms of the very distinct pieces of work that uh you've you've created over the past few years can you uh share with us uh, maybe three specific works uh, and what their names, uh, how they are titled, what they talk about, and maybe a little bit of how you think they drive the bigger objective of social change. Uh, I think the first one would be a body of work I created, I guess it was a, a book we published actually, of a collection of uh, poems by young people 
who was going to finish their senior high school, we went doing workshops with them on what they consider to be the change they want to see in their society that they will be leaving school to be going into. And this, the idea was that we want them to envisage exactly what they want to see when they get out of school. So this book, the Alakasa, Volume 1, we published in 2011, is one book I think uh, have done a lot of good because over the years, when they go back to see what they have uh, done, they can really look into it and also request what they are living right now. So I want to consider that one to be one. The other one will be in 2015 when uh, I was contracted to create a piece on the reenactment of uh, what was known at the time as the Berlin Conference or the Congo Conference. You know, we know during the 1884, 85, 83, 84, when the Europeans started to divide Africa, I mean, yes. the border for themselves. The 2015 was the 130 years, and so we're invited to yeah. come and speak specifically from the African perspective what was, what is, and what we hope that should happen in the future. So, that work also was a, a very strong social pressure I got also on myself, and also how to present a perspective that will open those who probably do not know that this issue is still happening and still going on in our society. And I believe it went down so well. And then also, I will also want to say the third piece is a project that, I mean, I won't say it's a piece, but then a project that I've been working on in the last 10 years with a German partner called the Framework frame and then walk like a uh, young people walking in and out of your frame because if you say you are a painter a, a dancer or you are a musician or you are an actor you don't always have to remain there once in a while try to go out of your frame and see what other people are also doing in their frame so that you can really appreciate and acknowledge what they are doing so we developed this project where we bring young people the ages between 16 and 26 from Germany to Ghana to do a workshop with the same group of young people. And then the year after, we bring the Ghanaians also back to Germany also to do the same thing. So we've been doing this for a long time and it's been very, very successful and it's been a lot of social change to young people who have not traveled outside their own community before. And then this, you see this cultural change that they get. And I mean, it brings a lot of openness to them. And I think this change has been very effective and we've seen it in their lives as the years goes by. Thank you, thank you. Uh, the same question to Marcy. Uh, can you share with us like three pieces of work that you've done over the past few years and how you think these pieces of work link to the bigger goal of advancing social change? Um, I think I'll I'll make reference to two because before these two projects, all I just did were bits and pieces of work, a recording here, yeah. a story or poem submitted here and there. But um, the largest bodies of work that I've done, uh, my first would be the album The X Agenda. It's a spoken word and hip hop um, co um collection. So the collection is basically a confrontation. It's a call to action. It's a conversation. It's a love letter. It's that voice that says, I am here. I am black. I'm African. I'm an immigrant. I'm a woman. I'm a man. I'm a child. Whatever that you decide to classify yourself as, uh, I'm out. But ultimately, I am human and I demand to be viewed as human. I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. I refuse to live like this. So um, the album basically says all that we have songs like uh, dollars and pounds we uh, express how our lives as foreigners has been affected by the pursuit of dollars and pounds because uh, by the pursuit of money because where we come from we don't have the money to allow us to have um, basic needs to allow us to live like normal people so that, that song basically I feel like it, it's the heart and soul of the whole um, project it talks about how we pushed from our homes by our own governments and we're forced to be at the mercy of other people's governments and stuff like that, where our humanity is reduced because we do not belong here. And uh, it ventures into the violence that we, is meted against us as foreign nationalities. Ultimately, it calls for us to be treated as humans. 
it's basically the heart of the whole album. It also um, has stuff that talks about um, the depression that we go through day by day. And it's, um, it's, it's actually says um, there is a better option than suicide. You find that in tracks like Flicker of Light. So as much as it's a, it's a call to action, as much as it's a confrontation, it attempts to be a voice of hope. So um, the whole album was a conceptual album. So after, that was like in 2019. It's accessible on Audio Mac and um, other uh, normal platforms. And then the next um, body of work, which is like a complete project, is was um, my collection of short stories titled Bringing Us Back. Now, uh, Bringing Us Back, um, the whole collection is based on migration and displacement. Like I said before, like my, my starting point as a writer has always been from a personal place. So these topics are... Um, as much as they're personal, they affect a lot of people. They affect me as a person who's living out of my own country. So uh, charity begins at home. So it's easy to write about things that you know well about. So the whole collection um, begins, it, put, it puts a spotlight on voices that push us from what is familiar and pushes us into spaces that are foreign in pursuit of trying to find, trying to find footing, trying to survive. And... Um, it ventures into, it zooms into issues of, of, of um, the boxes that we are put into. It's a, it's a quest of freedom, freedom to be allowed to express yourself as, um, as a woman who prefers to love a woman of the same gender, people of the same gender. It, 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 trans, it goes through issues of um, sexuality, the issues of, of, of violence that's committed against women, women abuse, there's a lot of that in, in, in the collection. And it also, tries to give women uh, the voice that says that um, I'm not just a victim. I can take control of my own life. I am powerful. I'm this powerful force. I'm this sexual being. You find this in stories like um, there's a story. What's the name of the story? The story is um, Escaping the Flames. So it explores women's sexuality. As much as we always treat it as victims, we also have other things other than just our victimhood. We are humans. We are people who can be um, vengeful, we are all that, we are fire. So the, the, the collection basically uh, pushes my agendas and things that I try to confront, things that bother me, that I see also bother other people. So that's um, bringing us back. That's the title of the collective collection. And yeah, um, the collection is basically, um, it was my um, master's in creative writing um, thesis. So I went on and published that into a collection of short stories. I can come oh, back to you now. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, for those who are viewing us online, uh, you can ask questions uh, to our panelists. And when you ask the question, include uh, the name of the panelists that would like to deal with a specific question. Our audience says you can ask questions, send us questions but specify whether the question goes to everyone or to a specific panelist. Uh, just getting back to our conversation, uh, there's always uh, in our societies, uh, there's an expectation that artists should produce a certain piece of work. So we still have censorship statutes uh, within our countries, I know there's a lot of censorship in Kenya. I know there's a lot of censorship in Zimbabwe. I know there's a lot of censorship in, in, uh, in, in Nigeria and, and Ghana as well. And so in your own experiences, especially with the kind of work that you're producing, uh, have you encountered a situation where the authorities uh, quote unquote, do not want you to speak truth to power, and how has this impacted how uh, you you uh, you produce, how you sort of express your creativity? Has it uh, prevented you from being as bold and as courageous as you would have liked to be, or it has forced you to censor yourself so that uh, you do not have a situation where uh, your life is constantly at risk because whatever you said uh, it 
to advance social change uh, is met by, let's say, things like state violence, uh, things like opposition from certain members of the society. Uh, so I'd like to start with Kojo. Mm. Uh, in terms of what you've produced so far, is there a situation where you've met a resistance either from the society itself or from the government? Uh, basically, yeah. not directly, not directly, but there is one incident that we we intentionally decided to do a performance that will disturb actually the society, but also questioning our existence that what makes us want to ask questions and what makes us not to ask questions. We did a performance one very early morning to in a blanket and it was as if there were two people having sex in a blanket, but then it wasn't sex, we were just making a movement just to create a societal uh, disturbance and also to raise questions on what people consider art to be. And so after the performance, we were actually collected to the community chief palace and we were interrogated very strongly because they wanted to put us behind the bus or something like that. I mean, but then later, some of our friends came to explain that that was art form. But in the area of whether politically we cannot do something, Ghana for some time now has this, we have freedom of expression and people can freely express themselves. But we haven't really come to that place where people are picked up from the house because it is something very political or something that against government. But the, it's also, also because I think our political uh, uh, landscape right now allows that people can freely say something but then when it goes directly from party situation to another party situation then you can have some issue and people can probably get you arrested or something but for me personally i haven't experienced anything yet like that even though i do very strong political pieces it's just that you hardly get shows and i don't get shows because i can feel that censorship a little bit but then I do not want to consider it because of that, but because I feel it's more for me, I'm doing my work. And so people don't call me for shows and I don't get any gigs here in Ghana, but it doesn't move me at all. Mufasa, uh, within the Kenyan environment, uh, to what extent have your work been uh, sort of resisted either by the public or by the government? Uh, I've actually had events cancelled because of identifying as an activist. Uh, I remember two of them, uh, the president was performing, and one is present, one is, I think, this happened, I think, three months ago. Uh, the others have been over, over, over time, basically in a five-year five period, but I think for three or four events, yeah. In fact, one, one time I was actually, somebody even called me and asked me, are you related to Boniface Mwangi, like, do you know Boniface Mwangi? Boniface Mwangi is a very known uh, artist in Kenya and the world. So he's asking me, are you related to him? Do you work with him? And I said, why are you asking? And then they canceled the event because of that. Uh, basically, the president was performing again, so they canceled that one. So I I would actually say what, that, what initiated the whole process of me having concept events as well was this... Uh, idea of probably not being allowed to perform on other stages so i felt like let me create my own concept events where i can say exactly what i want to say without anybody uh telling me uh basically controlling my speech controlling my work controlling what i write but yeah i i face it i think i, I i'll keep facing it basically yeah yeah but because we also speak for others uh have you heard of or maybe experienced a situation where there are other kenyan artists that have uh, been censored or be, by advocating for social change, whether this is political or whether this is environmental justice or whether this is directly. For example, we have issues of extrajudicial killings in the country. Uh, have you heard of situations where Kenyan artists have been forced either to pull down their art or to cancel an exhibition or to ban a book I don't know whether you can give us, maybe if you've had such an experience before, whether you are remotely uh, related to that piece of work or not. 
Okay, I can't pick one directly right now off the top of my mind, but definitely I, I know gigs that have been cancelled. Gigs have been cancelled. I know people who've been asked to pull out, uh, basically pull down stuff, especially uh, I know accounts that have been deactivated because of that as well. I'm speaking Instagram, wow. Twitter. Uh, I know people who've lost their, what do you call, what do you call that mark? The blue mark, the blue tick. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know, people, I know people who've lost uh, the blue tick because of uh, speaking of, uh, speaking so much into or speaking into, you know, uh, yes. what is about national government and stuff. So, uh, yeah, definitely. I know people who have been arrested as well. Uh, I remember even this guy, what's his name? Uh, there's a guy I know. Yo, the name, the name, the name, come on. Okay, but anyway, I'll probably bring it back in a few. But I know someone as well who was arrested because of basically sharing information that to the public, that, that it's just common knowledge about basically how the transition of uh, government from independence to, 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 to now, uh, how the stories that we're told in, taught in school is a bit different from what actually really happened, you know? Uh, so, yeah. So, yes, it, it, it's, it's happening. In fact, I would say this are, these are the challenges that are happening in terms of uh, governments constantly shrinking the democracy space. And art now is that tool, you know, that this is actually our, uh, this is our opportunity to, to make sure that uh, we are offering an, an, an alternative advocacy mechanism. Thank you. We go to Marcy. Uh, Sese, I don't know, we, we've been having a problem. Uh, we are sorry. Uh, you've been on the line, but we've not conversed with you. Uh, maybe, can you hear us? Sese? Can you hear us? Yes, Sese, can you hear us? Okay, as, as we wait to fix that, uh, let us move to Masi. Masi, uh, Zimbabwe's uh, political situation, I think, is probably one of the most publicized in the mm -hmm. continent. And there have been decades uh, where this, the political situation there have been used some, as some kind of a trope of, of what uh, it can mean for, for politics to go wrong, for development to go wrong. But then as a person on the ground and as a person who is an artist, the person who is uh, speaking about the human rights approach to development, can you maybe tell us whether what you write, what you produced, have you had some kind of censorship, uh, some kind of resistance, and whether Zimbabwe presents uh, an environment where artists can work freely? Um, definitely, uh, the government doesn't provide an environment that allows artists to work freely. Like you said, Zimbabwe's situation has been widely publicized. Uh, just last year, we had uh, the journalist um, Hopewell Chunon been arrested for I mean, been been arrested for speaking against corruption in the country. We also had the writer Titi Dangarembo been similarly arrested for questioning for, for protesting, uh, staging a one man pro one woman protest. Pro protest against uh, against corruption. So there is no space for speaking your mind. It's highly uh, censored. I guess I have been lucky because um, I, pre I, pre um, I, pre I mostly practice my art out of the country, like I'm in South Africa. And South Africa is like one country that is so pro freedom of speech. You can say anything about anyone and, and um, no one will try and um, quieten you, you know. So I've been able to explore what, I, what any topic fully without any fear of censorship. Now, that doesn't mean that um, everything is all well. It means that as much as they will not come and censor you with a boot in your face, um, there are ways of censoring people without necessarily arresting them. The type of material that I write has will never see the face of day on radio. You take a, your CD to a radio station, they won't play it. Even here in South Africa, they tell you like, no, it's too political, it's too radical. 
even in them they won't play it they'll they'll play like the softer versions of 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 you they'll play tracks that really do not uh, push the agenda you're trying to push it's only a few who manage to make it onto radio when when they really addressing social social issues but then the moment you come and try to bring people into account your staff will never be will never get airplay so that in a way is another form of censorship which most people in Africa are facing, that we are facing in Zim, that even in South Africa, as much as it's freedom of expression, um, many artists are facing that because no one will play anything that's political on radio, which targets the people who need to be targeted. So that that has been my experience with, with censorship. It's been sort of like indirect as, a, as opposed to being the overt censorship where you get arrested for writing a piece the way uh, writing a piece that's um, controversial. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have a few questions from our audience. And and by the way, uh, if you have a question for any of our panelists, please post the question and say whether it goes to everyone or to a specific panelist. Uh, so there are, there's a question here that has been posted by Nicolas Songora. And uh, this question goes to all our panelists. And how do we bridge the gap between renowned and grassroots activists? This has been the biggest challenge, especially with forming a cohesive force uh, while pushing for change in this country. Uh, so uh, with specificity to your own country, whether it's Ghana, whether it's Kenya, or uh, Zimbabwe, stroke South Africa, can you sort of tell us the challenges involved in bridging this gap between those artists that are already renowned and the grassroots activists? So I'll start with Kojo. Personally, I think that the, the challenge will be there for some time, and it's been there for some time. And uh, it's important that the people who are up will definitely want to do everything to remain up or even go more up higher. And so for those who are between the top and then the down, it's important for this gap to be tightened. So they try to share more ideas on how to go to places where the arts cannot go to them. There are places people who really need the art, but then the art cannot get to them because especially when we give the example like those in the capital, everything we do, awards and events, big events, big shows, they are all in the capital. And so it's important yes. that we start to move out of the capital and then go into all these grassroots, all these faraway distances and bring them the art. And these are the people who need to feel what the activism can do. These are the people who need to receive, these are the people who need to understand what art is. And so it will only lead to more challenge if we hope that the People up there or those who are on top will sometimes will say, okay, let's do this. It's hard. Sometimes you may approach them and they are not approachable. So I think that it's important for, for us who are where we are and we don't think that it's difficult to reach the grass. We should be able to just walk down to where the people are and then get in touch with them and then if that is uh, up that they deserve more to them. Uh, we've been having issues with Sese, but I think uh, we can now hear from her. Sese, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, sorry for the technical challenges. Uh, so can you please uh, sort of just introduce yourself, uh, the kind <laughs> of work you do, uh, the area of social change that you're yeah. most invested in? And mm -hmm. because you had already... Uh, dealt with uh and you can talk about a few pieces of of work that you've done uh, that you think sort of occupies the space of activism all right um my name is cc babo uh it's been a long journey getting here like into this space this premiere um my work uh i've been an artist i think since 2015 i don't think i know uh, since 2015, and uh, my work revolves around activism. Everything that I do, it's about human rights and social change. Um, I am a dancer. 
I also do spoken word, poetry, and um, I sing. Uh, works that I've done that are around, and that brings me to how I even stumbled into the art scene. I, I was a doctor before I became an artist. And I remember after two years of being in med school, I left for reasons, so many reasons that I just left. And at that time it wasn't leaving, I'm not coming back, it was just leaving. And during that time, that was now in, it was after three years. So that was in 2014, when the, my dress, my choice, uh, the violations against women was happening. And I wrote a piece out of being really mad about the way women were being stripped naked in the streets uh, about that. And then from there, my friend looked at the piece and was like, this is a spoken word. And I was, what? What's that? So that's how I ended up being a spoken word artist. Um, from then, I didn't know that I would end up being an artist. I didn't think so, uh, because you just don't leave medicine to go be an artist. So in 2015, when I at last moved to Nairobi, away from my mother, uh, that was the time I was able to pursue art because now there was never the constant pressure of, oh yeah, you know. Uh, then when I graduated, I made up my mind and I just followed through. The works, uh, my first art uh, production, um, Mufasa said it before, that when you're an activist, you tend to get very few shows. And that's so true in Kenya, like you get very few, no one wants you on their stage because they are, we wanna have a good time and all that. And then you come here with all this seriousness. And uh, so I started creating my own shows. And uh, at that time I was part of a team. Uh, so we would create our own shows and stage them. Uh, and one of those pieces was called History Versus His Story, which was just about uh, rewriting the history of uh, Kenya and Africa from the point of slavery and colonization and knowing that most of it that we were taught was just bogus. So we did that uh, and then no one wanted to host the event anymore. Um, we used to do it at this venue and they just we found our faces on the gate and we were not allowed to, uh, to come in anymore. And uh, away from that last year, uh, after a lot of time being blackballed again, uh, now not being blackballed because of being just an activist, but being blackballed because I'm queer. So um, last year was the first time again I was on stage before COVID shut everything down. And uh, we staged a show called uh, She Is, and uh, it was talking about just uh, the femicide issue that right now is so rampant, not just in Kenya, but all over the world. But what is so alarming is the number of women that we lose are weekly, daily, and this just not in Kenya, it's South Africa, it's Argentina, like it's everywhere. So we did that project and, um, yeah, I could say those are the projects that I've done that I can say were everything that I've done, but those were the ones where it would be stopped or someone would be so not enthusiastic about hosting us or whatever, because they're like, you know, I can't control what you say. And that's why most people don't call me for events because they can control what I say. Yeah, that's it. But I, I, I suppose, uh, I suppose, as somebody who identifies themselves as a queer artist, they are specific. We, we can say sort of doubly the, the, the kind of challenges that you face before you put your art there, art that sort of boldly identifies itself as queer. I know within our legislative framework, within our political environment, and. Uh, we also have a lot of cultural sort of resistance to uh, issues to do with queer and queer yeah. politics in a country like Kenya. How has the challenge been for you as a queer artist? Where do I begin? So um, at first, 
th there is this thing, and I think if there is any queer person who's watching this, they'll really relate. If you do other things, the first thing that always comes to you is, you know, I don't really need to tell them I'm queer. Like, is, how is that their business? And um, for a long time, that's how I operated. Like, they don't need to know that. But I realized that by the mere assumption that someone will see me and their first assumption will be of my gender and my sexuality, their first assumption will be that I am cis to mean that I am of the gender uh, that doctors said I am and uh, I am heterosexual. Uh, by that virtue, the first thing will be invisibility. And so for a long time, it was in between the lines of privacy or secrecy. And uh, in, I think, 2018, uh, a lot changed in my life in 2018 because it found us the year before I just graduated from med school and finding my footing and deciding how I wanted to live my life. And that was the time I decided, you know what, to help with it. Um, what's the worst that can happen? And I didn't know that the worst that could happen could happen for almost two years of people not calling me to any event of um, if someone calls you to an, an event, they tell you, please don't tell the people at this event that you're queer. And knowing that deep within me, art is how I finance everything in my life. So if someone tells me that it's either I eat or I hide, and uh, th that took some time. That took some time to get used to the fact that nowadays I don't care because I'll be in a space and uh, I don't want to work with people who don't see me in my entirety. So it doesn't matter. But during that time, it really did. In 2018 and 2019, every time that I would apply for a performance or something, and then it will be denied. And most of the time you realize it was denied because you're queer and it's a soft black ball, but yeah, it happens. Yeah. Just, uh, there's a question Nicholas asked uh, in terms of how to bridge uh, the gap between the renowned uh, artist and, and, and the grassroots uh, activists. I don't know in your sort of experience, uh, in terms of building synergy and in terms of building solidarity uh, yeah. among uh, queer uh, activists, uh, maybe in Kenya, how to what extent have you sort of worked to bridge this gap so that the message is not uh, only concentrated on the on the urban areas, on the metropolis, but also on the peri-urban and the rural areas. Uh, currently, I'm in Kisumu. <laughs> I'm supposed to be headed to Busia. Uh, why? Because, oh my God, why am I feeling like I'm going to get emotional? This wasn't supposed to be. It's supposed to be revolution power. And so um, why I'm here is because I, I'm in transit to go to Busia because there are queer people there who need me. There are queer people there whom I'm supposed to talk to and tell them that... Uh, this is not the end of the world or something like that and uh, teach about activism to them because I think the moment you're minoritized and marginalized you can't help it activism comes to you so naturally because every moment of your life is like it's a fight whether you want to engage in the fight or not that's none of the system's business every moment of your existence is a fight so yeah, that's where I'm headed. And about bridging that space, I realized that we try to deal with things as if they are single issues. That someone will come and say that you guys are queer. With us, we're trying to fight. So we know of extrajudicial killings and the way the police have been killing uh, young men on the streets. And someone will say, like, right now, we're just fighting against the police killing us. And um, the same police that kills you, kills me. Uh, the same system that is stepping on your neck is stepping on mine. And until we find a point of intersectionality where we all lift this leg from our necks, the moment you allow them, and I'm gonna give an example, maybe that will be touchy to people. In 2017, police were killing people indiscriminately in Kisumu. And it was, they always riot, they always throw stones, everything, everything. 
but when it moved and now it was in Nairobi and everyone's like you know what the police are really bad they don't protect us anymore but um it was okay when it was someone else but when it got to you it's now no longer okay because it is on you and for that reason i think that is the bridging that we need we need to find a, pot, a point of intersectionality in how we do our activism that the grassroots person what they go through i know maybe you as someone who lives in nairobi might not even have a clue but finding a point of grace and not being louder but just holding space so that they can be able to articulate how they feel and how they see things really changes so much yeah for me that intersectionality is the bridge yeah wow that's that's important uh, uh sort of getting back to our audiences uh we need questions you can direct our qu the questions to uh all the panelists or to individual panelists uh we want to move to in terms of taking stock of uh at and and how it has so far achieved certain milestones in achieving social changes within our societies uh so i'll again ask this to all our panelists uh if you could look back both to yourself as, as an individual artist and also as an uh as a member of the bigger community of artists that are working to uh achieve social change do you think within the context of your countries do you think we have made progress especially in terms of speaking truth to power in terms of educating uh the public through our art uh so that uh, there's an understanding of of human rights there's an understanding of of human values and especially within the context of the human rights approach uh to development so i'll i'll ask marcy uh maybe to give us uh some kind of stock in terms of what have you seen that have been the successes so far uh in terms of using art for social change and what do you think are the main weaknesses or the main challenges that artists face within your country um i think um art has managed to get to a space where it forces people to to um interrogate and, and question certain abnormal abnormalities that we have come to accept as as um as normal like um artists will speak about how bad the government is treating us and um they'll speak about it in the music people hear that to an extent that they are prepared to go and march to say no we want to march against these things we've had some some riots happening in in, in some people writing against them protesting against the government even though they know that this is what's going to happen you know my art has managed i think art has played that role of of getting people to get out of their comfort zone to say no enough is enough we want to get them and um but uh, people still continue to face challenges of the major challenge of artists being censorship like uh like i mentioned the subtle form where they won't even play your music on radio and um the other challenge is is just basically i guess fear like some artists will refuse to write up, to confront real issues because they fear that whole aspect of like no I want to get a show if I speak about ABCD so let me water my art down so that I can at least get a gig I can get into these spaces um but basically I think we are doing a lot as artists to try and address social issues to try and uh, get people to engage people are engaging and um I don't know if I can speak about uh, mention this like um it all begins on on a personal level like with your own families and stuff like that i remember we, we were talking about um the issue of um sexuality with one of my cousins and he had views a negative views about um bisexual and homosexual people so when i uh, gave my own personal views to 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 him and questioned him like uh, a few things like okay what makes your sexuality better than the next person's sexuality what gives you a better right to to love the way you want to love than um and like a right that's um higher than that of the next person 
So that conversation with my with my um, cousin, at the end of the day, I believe it helped him change his perspective towards um, uh, homosexual people. So that shows you that okay, that those are my views as an ordinary person. Now, if I translate my views into an art form, imagine how many more people they could actually touch and affect. So I believe that art is doing its role in in small pieces like through the concept of each one teach one that one life that you affect you never know the ripple effect it has on the rest of the people so i feel like we are we are something is happening even though it's we, we see the results in small little things but something is happening and i believe there will be a bigger tangible change if you continue um pushing at a steady pace uh, Kojo, maybe if you can just pick it from where Marcy has left it, uh, within, your own, within your own country, within your own space, uh, what are some of the successes that you can say has been achieved uh, by using art to advance social change? And in the same extent, what, what are some of the challenges that you're facing or that artists are facing in your country to advance social change? Yeah, I think I will go with the challenge. The cha one of the challenges that the, the, the system, I mean, if I say the system, I mean the government, have kind of muted themselves to the idea of the art. So that, I mean, if artists are even doing arts that are to confront government and the system, it doesn't hit them anymore. They really are like kind of dead to that kind of feeling. But if it's only a journalist or someone who is in the social media, like uh, uh, on the media, like the traditional media, that they attack, sometimes they even kill and people get lost for these reasons. But the art form or the artists itself have a lot of really strong revolutionary works going on, but it seems not to get into them or probably they are deliberately ignoring it. And so I don't think we really have that kind of situation here. But uh, to also say that what kind of art forms are, uh, what, what the art form has really achieved or gotten, we've really come far, especially with uh, the spoken word poetry. Past years now, it was never known anywhere, but these days, even on uh, uh, government level, they invite artists to come on state functions, and which we think it's really, really like kind of good now. And also to have government contract the artists to do certain projects, I think that's also become really something that's popular in our space here now. So for me, I think that the, the fact that we are having a lot of these things happening because the artists themselves also are really like doing a lot of great stuff that uh, they don't look at what government is going to say or it's not going to say they just releasing their work and i think that is really encouraging in our space here okay uh mufasa on the same note uh if you could look back a few years uh maybe over the past 10 years uh what do you think has been the main successes of uh of activism and what are the main challenges that we are facing now, say for example in Kenya? Uh, I think I think for me change change is something that is it's a process basically. And artists play the role of starting the process, you know. Uh, when I look at for example, just recently we had a we had a uh, we had a project with Kate Spills. We were we were thinking about we were concerned about lack of pedestrian crossing in the C B D in Nairobi City Center. And we decided, you know what, to engage the county as well. So we spoke to them. And I think the, the, the fact that it was art, it made it more, you know, it, 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 it takes away the, it, like the attack form. It looks like, ah, this is something beautiful. This is something creative. Uh, it, takes, it doesn't look like we are fighting them, you understand? And they allowed us, actually, uh, they allowed us to paint, uh, mm -hmm. to paint a pedestrian crossing uh, in town, the crosswalk. And I remember right after that, we started seeing more of them now. We started doing that. I saw that in Westlands just right after, like right, right after we did that, we started now doing the markings. Because uh, of us, we're thinking a road that is not safe for a kid to cross, not safe for anyone. Uh, so I believe just that idea that 
at some point you can there's, there's an even uh, we can collaborate with with, uh, with uh, government bodies and stuff like that to do something that is beneficial to everybody and is for the good sake of everyone it's a good thing that's a positive i think the other thing would be uh basically seeing how right now over the years we have had a transcendence in terms of more platforms of sharing i mean when i look at uh, online like instagram i, I, I look at kenyan uh, celebrities like Intugush, who use satire basically uh to talk about uh government issues or to talk about governance uh i can look at a program like xyz that is now on national tv and they use you know puppets to challenge uh governance and leadership and basically decisions made by our national leaders uh when i look at that i see it as a you know as a plus uh i also look at look basically when, when i look at now the growth even of, of spoken word you know uh, when i look at local or uh, community poets I look at them as community assets. Uh, I look at them as people who are there to make sure that information or the information about the community is relatable and is right, and it's not. Uh, what, what, how do how do I say? It? Basically, to make sure that the voice from their community is 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 actually speaks to what their issues are uh because there's been a lot of distortion you know how uh, politics works so i believe uh art helps to to basically identify uh the true voices the honest voices of the community uh and even now i see it as well as a this was when i talk, talk about the shrinking space i look at it as a the alternative advocacy mechanism that has grown like like really really grown i see many artists right now I see many people who didn't know about art initially. Like even the word activist wasn't there initially, but now we have more people who identify as activism, artists, you know, as activists. Because uh, I remember for me, it's something that came along later. But I know people right now who come into art and choose this path from the beginning. So I believe that's also a plus for them. Uh, I will look at it as I look at uh, uh, the positive of art as well as being something that or rather the alternative advocacy mechanism that removes the academic stigma uh, yes. around information, you know, it takes mm -hmm. away the academic stigma, making it more accessible and appealing to audiences of varying ages, varying uh, literacy levels and socioeconomical issues, or basically social economic classes. Ah, thank you. Uh, Ceci, uh, just to amplify uh, voices, uh, can you tell us uh, the kind of progress that have been achieved over the past few years uh, and what are the main challenges that are sort of influencing the ability uh, of you specifically as a queer artist so that we amplify uh, that kind of voice uh, to achieve social change? First, um, because I don't know where to begin. Let me start again. So uh, from um, my side as a queer person first, before I'm an artist, I'm a person. And all these things make me. So my queerness, uh, the person that I am, my artistry. And uh, one thing that I would love everyone to know is there is nothing as hard as trying to exist in a country where you're illegal. And um, that is because Kenya still uses the penal code. And um, it says that queer people are illegal. I, I don't know any other terms to make it simpler than that. They're just illegal. So police can harass us and killings and everything. Uh, the last 10 years, for me, what has changed artistry the most is social media. Because before this, uh, and that is artistry in terms of activism, the only artist, and even right now, the only artists that get played the most are what they consider, can I call it big wig? Uh, the famous artist and uh, artists who've been here for a while and that kind of thing. And then you notice that artists who are doing activism, they're work or anything is never highlighted in the everyday media and 
they call it traditional media where they, they don't news uh, music nothing plays their songs or poetry or anything of that sort so for me that is like social media has really changed the game for us because right now i'm at liberty to say what i want to say how i want to say it record myself and go put it on my youtube channel or my instagram or anywhere else and uh, people will come and watch it and for me that that is what has changed the game as a queer person now who's also an artist that also changed it for me because when i got blackballed and everything where would i go social media where could i go and work social media and that really changed the way uh, my artistry shaped out and uh, for me when i say when i look at all the moments where artistry has been used to really change everything my best example is always uh, Burkina Faso uh, Burkina Faso changed how i view artistry and it has changed it forever because when the revolution started it was by artists and they had even a 30 day program like 30 day deadline on how they were going to deal until the time that um, they banned the parliament until that time uh so for me uh those like social media has changed how activism as in artistry uh gets to look like and for me that is the stock uh social media is our biggest win ever ever getting to occupy that space yeah uh in just to link with uh the challenges that artists are facing today we are in year two of the pandemic and i think uh artists just like every other profession uh is incredibly influenced uh in terms of their economic needs in terms of their direction uh what they can produce mm -hmm. and i just wanted to open this to everybody uh the pandemic, uh, how has it influenced uh, your work as an artist? And have, have there been any measures uh, taken at the society level, say, for example, by the government, uh, sort of ease uh, the kind of burden, the kind of pressure, and, and maybe also stimulate artistic production? So, I see. Um. Yes, the pandemic, uh, it hasn't been easy for, for anyone. Um, and I think like artists have been most hard hit because um, before the pandemic, most of us relied on, on, on um, public performances. Um, but then um, the, the positive that came out of, out of this pandemic is, um, is best alluded to by what uh, Stacey spoke about now, like how social media has like, been a big thing for art so that has enabled some people to be able to come out and still be able to and it still hasn't been enough because uh there are people like grassroots level who do not have access to to wi-fi who stay in places with bad connectivity who cannot afford that charges so um as much as there is this new platform that people can use to explore and push their art there are still challenges that have been faced but I feel like um, government um, in some places has tried to play a role. Like um, in Zim, they have been packages that have been going out to, to certain artists um, just to help them like cope with the circumstances. And I've seen everywhere there's been all these, um, all these grants been, um, been set aside for, for artists to apply for assistance where they need assistance. So the existence of those things have been quite helpful for those who've been able to get those grants and stuff like that. But I feel like um, it, 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 it has helped, it has forced us to try and adapt to, time, to the times, try and adapt with um, the idea of not being confined to one space. It's forced us to go more digital than before. And I feel like one good thing for me on a personal level that has come out of this pandemic is it has forced me to sit back, reflect on my work, and to create work, you know, uh, I think I've created a lot of content during the lockdown period than I, I, I've ever done before because there are less shows. There are less shows for you to go and perform, which now gives you more time to go and to go and go back and create. 
And it's also forced me to sort of like think out of the box, like, okay, um, Mufasa, was it, I think, was it Mufasa? No, not Mufasa, like um, one of the panelists who spoke about how he had to add, um, you know, it was Mufasa, he spoke about how he had to add music to, to his poetry. It's something that I've been forced to like, okay, I need to, I need a game changer. I cannot just go on stage and just recite my poetry with no background music. It's something that has forced me to like, okay, I need to make it more musical, more engaging so that I attract more audiences. So basically this new the pandemic and the challenges to sport has forced us to get out of our comfort zones and, um, and, um, and raise our game. And uh, so basically, yeah, it's, it's forced us to, to work and to reconsider the way we art and the way we package our art and the way it's even given us bigger audiences than we had before when we had shows. It's basically people in Polokwane who have access to your show. But now the whole world gets to see your show. So it's a bigger audience. That's one positive that came out of this whole pandemic. Uh, there's, a, there's a question here by one of our audiences, Stephen Okwan. He asked, how do we sustain conscious art amidst the tough economic times caused by the pandemic? Uh, to what extent, for example, in your case, Marcy, have you been forced to sort of party to, to the audience so that uh, your art is able to maybe uh, be socioeconomically uh, profitable to you? Um, I, I guess the starting point for me is just trying to make sure that you always have content like um, always creating, like always create, you never know like when someone might say, oh, um, I saw this this material of yours here and there, uh, it might be perfect for this uh, event I'm running, can you please come and, and perform? So I think uh, for me, it's just an issue of like constantly creating and constantly challenging yourself to create better than your previous works. So, um, and being more visible on social media, that's one of my, I'd say it's one of my weaknesses because of the fact that I have a day job, um, I hardly have time to be on social media. But on the times that I managed to go out there and put stuff out there, there are people who managed to see it and people who managed to reach out and say, okay, we've seen this. So I think for me, the, the, the key is firstly, before you, you, you tackle other challenges, make sure that you always have content, always create and be persistent, persistent, be dedicated and be consistent. And uh, I think everything else will, will just fall into place. That's the way that I have allowed myself to go through things these days, just creating and staying um, conscious of who's looking for material, where do I submit material? So it's an it's a issue of um, creating and researching who's looking for content and consistently submitting, even if your stuff gets rejected, you continuously submit because after so many rejections, a yes eventually comes. So creation and submission is are the two key words for me yeah uh, thank you uh kojo uh, if you can just comment a little bit on the uh on the pandemic and how it has influenced your work and then there's also a question to you by chunga otiende uh, how do you achieve emotional appeal during your performance and how do you transfer your energies from you the artist to the audience Okay, I mean, first, my, my, my work is more, my performances are more of a spontaneity. And so it's important for me to get into the space. And definitely when I'm in the space, I just get this feeling of wanting to serve, like I been given the platform or something to give back to the people. So it just come to me naturally. I hardly force it because I do those performances that I can take words from the people and then I can ask what you want to hear or maybe I even pick up challenges and then challenge myself with things that are not even in that space. But then I try as much as possible to feel what is happening there, the, the, the vibe in the space and I try to give back to my audience that I very much uh, look forward to giving back to them what they really need to have. I don't also look at the number of people who are there, what they need to have, I give. There are some people who always will change the piece they want to do simply because there are no 
many people or that kind of thing. I hardly work like that. Uh, with the pandemic and what it has done with us is that we were lucky that when the lockdown started, we switched on to social media, uh, especially the Zoom. We started at this event where we host the three parties almost every week from, I think, uh, April to now. We still have this going on, and for some reason, to be able to keep some of us uh, alive, and people are still creating. Even though we hardly get the chance to meet in person, we've been able to hold on to it, that, and that it has kept some people going on. But over the period, people also started becoming very reluctant. They almost forget because everything seemed to be changing also very fast. Thank you. Uh, there's a question here that is specific to Kenya. Uh, it's, it's posed by Manyata Youth Entertainment. It is very critical to launch a mass movement during these hard times as we are approaching elections in the country. Activism is highly needed to offer civic education, speak to the hearts of communities and ignite the heat from within. Revolution is the best word to use, but the question remains. Are we ready? Uh, and I think uh, Ceci was uh, uh, speaking about this, the, the fact that certain revolutions across the continent have been inspired by art. Uh, so if we agree that we are having serious critical issues in the country, uh, can art be used to inspire revolution? Is that an objective that art can pursue? So I'll post this to Ceci and, and Mufasa. I believe the revolution that we are, I believe for surface revolution to happen, mind revolution that it needs to happen. I think the revolution that we need to have is the revolution of the mindset. Uh, and I keep saying that change will not happen when we change our leaders because our leaders are not exactly the problem. The problem is us, the voters, the people who make these decisions, the people who decide uh, who to vote for, the people who uh, do not basically put our leaders into account, uh, basically question their accountability and stuff like that. Uh, so I, I hope that what this is, what the whole thing that has been happening lately in terms of basically people getting tired of this kind of governance, I hope that what it does is it leads to a mindset revolution. Because if that is done, then it's easier for us to do a surface revolution. And, and, and I would probably say that now this is where us as artists, where we come in is we should make sure that people do not get comfortable. Because that's the thing, like the moment you get comfortable with injustice or with bad governance, you're like, ah, that's how, that's how it's always is. That's how it, it always is that it, it becomes a problem as well. I think for us, it just unseat people from being comfortable with injustice. We have to constantly remind people that this is not how it should be. Like, this is not what we should allow. We should not be comfortable with this. Yeah, thank you. Yes, Ceci? Um, I totally agree with Mufasa on that. Uh, completely we need a revolution of the mind uh, where people won't be because sometimes you walk in town and then you see hawkers being beaten and this woman is carrying a child and they're being beaten and people are just walking past that oh yeah that is what is happening or people getting killed and someone's like why are you outside at night i'm like it's not a death penalty so we need to get people to that place of at least hope I think where Kenya has reached right now, it feels like there is no hope. Just get your money enough so that this doesn't affect you because it's not changing. And I think that's how we are really operating right now. That you see everyone is just walking towards like, get my bag and I'll be above it and then I can't be oppressed like everyone else or go and live in this place. Where, like It's just people trying to escape oppression in the way they know best but as artists I think we could change that by really like changing their minds and giving hope uh, I can't say I'm quite a hopeful 
artist. Uh, but yes, I really think that those who can should give hope um, and talk about change in a way that people see it being something that they can do and something that they can participate in. And I don't know, no one is, in, is from Kisumu here. If you're in the inbox and you're from Kisumu, I think in Kisumu, that's how we do it. Like as artists, we go and talk to the people around and you just tell them like, you know what? This and this has been happening and are you aware? And all that, and that's how we get people to go to the streets by telling them that what is happening is wrong. Sometimes people don't even notice because it's been going on for too long. No one even knows what the other side of that story would look like. So yeah, we need a lot of hope. Yep. <laughs> hope, hope, hope. Uh, there's a question that has been posed to Mas. It's, it's very specific in terms of uh, you are living in South Africa, but you're originally from Zimbabwe. So Johnson Mwangangi, Ask like, do you feel your impact would be more if you are practicing your activism in your own country other than South Africa? Yes, uh, I think um, my my um, my more my art would be more impactful if I was practicing from my own home because the art that I speak to it's mostly directed to situations of us as Zimbabweans, as much as they may affect other people, other, um, they may be experienced by other people. It mostly affects people that, um, that are in Zim, and it's mostly targeted towards the people who are in power positions in the country specifically. So I feel like it will have more if, impact because practicing art from outside your own, own country, you feel alienated at some point. You feel like, you are not speaking well to the situation of the people on the ground because as much as I'm from Zim, my situation is way better than those who are on the ground. Um, I have a job that I can come to every day. I can take my kid to a decent school. I can have a decent meal at home. But many families back in Zim are unable to, to have what I'm able to have. And I feel like if I'm on the ground, I'm more able to experience it firsthand because I feel like my Zim experience is secondhand at this point. If I was on the ground, I'll be able to feel it like more firsthand. And I feel like I'll be able to even take out my art more in a more impactful way because firsthand experience, what I'm talking about. So I feel like, yeah, being away has taken away a bit of something which could be more impactful had I been expressing my art from a space of being within home. But at the same time, being out of home again allows me certain liberties, certain freedoms that... I would not be able to, to explore had I been from home. For, for example, I'm, an, I'm, able, I'm able to earn an, an income like uh, every month, a decent income. With that income, I'm able to have monthly shows going on, poetry shows where it's not just me doing my art, it's other people being granted a platform to, to have their art. So it's in another way, it's growing that whole activism. It's taking it to larger platforms than they would have been had I been just practicing for my own space and not having ways of sharing a platform with other people. So it's a, it's a two-way situation. It's not just like a one-sided, there are two sides to, to, to each coin. And this is one of those, those situations. Okay, thank you. We'll, uh, we'll take a few more questions and then uh, we'll go to the closing remarks. Uh, there's a... Uh, uh, there's one of our viewers called Terity, uh, uh, a question, posing a question to all our panelists. I know we've talked about social media, but what different platforms do you have in your various occupations for those who look up to you and to the upcoming artists and how can they reach you? So I'll start with uh, Kojo. What platforms do you yeah. use and, and how can they reach you? Yeah, we are on the, um, almost all the social media platforms, especially Facebook and uh, YouTube channel. We also much available, we use uh, the Zoom currently for our weekly show. So we are very much available on these uh, channels. 
we now beginning to get on the fiscal face-to-face -face events. We are now going to start. We used to run a monthly event at the National Theatre. So we are now planning on getting to start on that one again, where people can come regularly. Yeah. Mufasa, uh, what platforms can you recommend to young artists, those who are just upcoming, and uh, how can they reach you? I think people should use the advantage of uh, social media right now. Uh, right now, we have a lot of recorded material from the past uh, that, is, that is recent, that is on YouTube. Like even for purpose of poetry, for example, you can look at channels like Stiver. So the poetry, like there's so many channels where you can access spoken word pieces from a wide range of artists who come in different perspectives and styles. Uh, you can also read from, from uh, basically, you can have online readings and everything else. But myself, uh, in terms of my accessibility, um, I normally use Mufasa Poet across all social media platforms. So Mufasa Poet on Facebook, YouTube, uh, Instagram, Twitter, yeah, Mufasa Poet. Ceci. Um, provided you know how to spell my name, you'll get me on all social medias. I'm uh, more active on uh, Twitter because I don't have a lot of photos and uh, that's for Instagram and because I don't have much to say except once in a while go to war with bigots. Yeah, uh, I have conversations um, on Instagram and uh, YouTube and mostly it's uh, for queer people. If you're a queer person and you're here, just go search the Bambis. Uh, you'll find we hold conversations on human rights uh, for queer people and just the politics that is around everything that we are and just finding our ways around the world. Yeah. Uh, so there's a question to all our panelists in terms of, uh, there's always this distinction that is often being made when people create art especially when people create art for sort of a social function. And uh, one of our viewers is asking, how do, you, how do you separate between activism and your own artistic creativity? So I'll, I'll, I'll start with Marcy on this. Um, for me, there's basically no distinction. Like um, I'm, an, I'm an activist, but as much as I'm that, I need my my work to have a certain aesthetics. I make sure that um, I make it as creative as possible when I, when I do whatever I do in that um, activism space. So there is no distinction. I'm, I'm, whatever I'm doing, I'm just making sure that it's creative as possible. It's aesthetically pleasing to the ear. Um, it's just a full package. So I don't really make a distinction. When I set out to write, I'm writing and it has to meet a certain standard. Okay. Uh, Mufasa, is there any difference between the two when you are doing activism and then you are basically pursuing the objective of artistic creativity? I'm actually with Marcy there. Like, I'm just, I'm just being real. Like, that's what I do. Like, being real, being honest, and trying to be relevant by basically speaking to stuff that is true and relatable to my audience. Yeah. Wow. Kojo. Is there, when, when uh, one of our viewers is asking whether uh, you have, you separate between activism and then the pursuit of artistic creativity? Yeah, of course, I believe that. Uh, yeah. We've lost you. We've lost you, Kojo. I, okay, maybe we can move to Sethi. Sethi? I don't think there is a difference. Um, because I think as activists who are also artists, we've just found creative ways to put in what we want to say in a way that I could have said something and... If I would have, 
talked it out just that, in sir. words, no poetry flair or anything of that sort, I might get arrested. But if I put it inside my poetry and by the time that I'm done, you don't even notice what I said, but people who got it, got it, that kind of thing. So for me, there is no difference. Your creativity just helps you to get away with more things. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, I think we've had a really comprehensive conversation uh, in terms of the link yeah. between art and social yeah. change. And uh, before we conclude, I'd like to give uh, our panelists uh, one minute uh, to give a closing remark. So I would start with uh, Marcy. Yeah, man. Um, I, I guess I, what I can just say now is thank you uh, for this platform. It's been amazing. But to the artist, uh, man, um, times are difficult, times are hectic and all, but never uh, put your head down, keep your head up all the time, keep creating. Um, am I audible? Yeah, no, basically just keep creating, keep um, pushing and never give up. Things will not always stay the way that they are. And take advantage of social media, like take advantage of the learning platforms to advance your, your art, to upskill yourself, take advantage of social media. Don't just be there to, to waste time. Make sure that each time you're on social media, you're leaving there with something that's going to upgrade you or like um, upskill you as an artist to better you. So that's basically all I have to say. And let's be kind to each other. And yeah, one love. Mufasa, closing remarks. Yeah, I would say basically just many uh, encourage artists or rather um, request artists basically to have, especially in this time of COVID, because one thing for me that has happened is I've realized that we need to have uh, wider platforms of engaging with the audience other than just using the stage. Uh, yes, we need to have books, we need to record material that can play uh, on TV, on radio, uh, we need to have more merchandise, we need to have spaces, uh, we need to have just more spaces of reaching out to, 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 to the audience, yeah. I think that helps a lot, uh, so that you don't always depend on gatherings. You can gather the audience in your own other ways, you know, especially in the, uh, in the world of social media that we live right now. And I'll probably say one other thing. Good art can educate and create empathy. And empathy induces personal change. Yeah. And then last but not least, change won't come when you need this change. Change will come when you change. Thank you. Uh, Kojo, I don't know whether we can hear you now. Kojo. Kojo, are you back? <laughs> can you just give a closing remark, a one-minute closing remark? Baba, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you now. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, I just want you to... Uh, art uh, has a lot of change in it, and so we need to give a lot of uh, space for young people at least from their growing stages to really have the access to art more and like Mufasa said we need a lot of uh, avenues and a lot of platforms where the art platforms can be shared we need to get more on TV and radio and all these places but uh, especially for my country we hardly have a lot of these spaces but now it's coming up on like a few years back and so we believe that if a lot of space is given to the art form a lot of change can also happen in our society thank you uh ceci um my closing remark is I would want everyone who considers themselves an activist, an activist um, in every form that you come, human rights advocate and all that, that um, first, there are no single issue struggles. Uh, and I'll quote Audre Lorde on that, like there are no single issue struggles because we don't live single issue lives. So everything is everything. And second, no one can own the revolution. 
if you try to own the revolution, it will kill you. You'll die physically, uh, mentally, emotionally, in every way that you are, because the revolution demands that every one of us participate in it. And in whatever way that you take, if you could be the other side, you're the oppressor, whatever, whatever side you take, no one owns the revolution. So we need to find more spaces of bringing our heads into one and finding a way to sanitize and change the, bring the change that we want to see. Other than that, nothing will ever change. We'll keep fighting and then tomorrow we are 10 steps back. No one gets to own the revolution. That's all. I want to thank our panelists uh, for joining us and educating us. Uh, when we learn from each other, we become better and we are able to build synergies uh, to pursue social change. I want to thank all our panelists for being with us. I want to thank all our viewers. Uh, it's been good having you with us. And thank you for joining us. Until next time, bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.